My name's Catherine Barker. Um, I'm president-elect of the Music Teachers Association and I am uh, really delighted to to go through the national plan with you today. I was part of the expert panel when this was put together last year, which was a really interesting experience for those of us who were involved in that. And I suppose um, uh, for me, that felt like the first step in the process. Really, in fact, that was probably the easiest bit uh, coming up with the ideas of everybody who was um, involved around the table and the wider consultation groups and everything, all the information we had to put together uh, for the plan itself. The really hard bit, uh, which is down to all of us now as a collective group, is to bring it to life in the schools across the country. And uh, hopefully we can start that process together uh, today by thinking about um, how we can review our provision and set targets for development. So, um, uh, in my other job that I do alongside uh, the Music Teachers Association work, I'm also Head of Music and Performing Arts in a large multi-academy trust called United Learning. Uh, I've seen a couple of teachers on, on here who are from United Learning Schools, so it's great to have you with us. But from any school, uh, it's also great to work with you, whether you're in an academy or a, a maintained school or even an independent school, everyone is welcome and hopefully this will be value for everybody. So we're going to get started. Um, the whole, uh, the way this, this session is going to run is I'm going to start by giving you an overview, just a bit of a recap of what is in the plan and what does it mean for us working in schools. And then from there, I'm going to talk you through some of the resources that are available to be able to support you with your thinking around the national plan. And then uh, finally, from there, we're going to go into quite a detailed uh, session uh, where everybody um, is going to need to think really hard about what it is that makes music tick in their schools and what exactly do you want to do to really take it to the next level so we can really bring the plan to life. So hopefully this is working. Excellent. So the um, the national plan um, is a long document. It's uh, you know, multiple, multiple pages. And I'm sure many of you spent uh, a happy hour reading all the way through from cover to cover. But if you haven't, uh, I will give you a brief summary of what is in there. Now, something that's been spoken about quite a lot are these seven key features of high quality school provision. And uh, um, I think this is really helpful because it provides absolute clarity about what we should expect to see from school to school. It's a really, it's quite a simple statement, uh, to be honest, for schools and a starting point for a conversation. We don't have this in our school, for example. Why not? Or even better, how could we bring it together? So um, none of this is particularly rocket science. The first part is about curriculum music. Um, I read one hour a week really as once a week. Um, I'm not going to be a stickler about, you know, 55 minutes, 50 minutes, um, 65, 70 minutes. It's about regular weekly provision for all children, young people from Key Stage 1 right up to the end of Key Stage 3 as part of an entitlement, because after all, that is what is in the national curriculum. Uh, and that is a core offer for all young people. Also about access to lessons across a range of instruments and voice. So this is our one-to-one -one instrumental provision or small group provision or whole class ensemble teaching or small group teaching. There are lots of different models for this all across the country and there's some really exciting things going on that we can learn from. Also, we know that uh, learning an instrument is uh, even more exciting when you do it with others. And that's um, certainly I can think of my own experience as a young musician. I got really excited about playing my instrument when I got a chance to play in, in groups with others. And uh, the, it's our role as teachers in schools to be able to facilitate that. So um, school choirs or vocal ensembles and also school ensembles or bands or groups are a core part of what should be delivered in a music department. But in order for all of that to happen, we need to have sufficient space so that rehearsals can happen. And also young people need sufficient space and opportunity to be able to practice. Now this really is a, a social justice issue uh, that we know that there are many uh, young people who um, just by uh, 
their accommodation may not have space uh, in order to be able to do the practice that they need to do or have access to the specialist equipment. I'm thinking of drummers, I'm thinking of guitarists with amplifiers and all that kind of stuff. So the school has got to be at the hub, at the centre of the music, musical experience and be able to kind of open its doors wide for young people to make the most of the, the resource that they have. All of that leads to the possibilities for termly school performances. Uh, the, um, and there's nothing particularly, um, uh, there's no constraints around that, that they have to be you know, formal school concerts or informal concerts. But what the plan is recognising is that the musical um, development is not just about process, about putting it together, it's also about product, those landing moments where you can feel really proud about the achievements of the young people. And finally, uh, we know that most young people who go through a music education um, will be part of the wider audience of music in their, in, as part of their lifelong appreciation of music. And we'd like that to start as soon as possible within the school. Um, so the opportunity to, involve, to enjoy live performance at least once a year is an important part of the experience for young people. And again, there's no constraints around that. Uh, I think schools have got the agency, the agency to be as imaginative as they can uh, with that sort of idea. Um, but as I said, it's about prefer preparing the audience of the future, but also about nurturing and stimulating young people to be really excited about music and see where it can take them, see where um, it can head to. So look, many schools will find this straightforward. In fact, a lot of the schools that I work with look at this list and they say, I'm already doing this. I've done the national plan, I'm finished. And that's true to an extent uh, for, for lots of schools. So uh, we will talk in the rest of this uh, session about how you can go deeper and how you can really um, grab what's in the plan around the edges uh, to really develop your provision. But we do know that some schools are going to find this ask of the seven key features quite tough. I think particularly small schools could find this quite challenging. Uh, some primary schools are going to find this difficult as well to make the links and to have the, the, the confidence and the specialist staff to be able to deliver this. And I think there's also some issues with this list. Personally, there's nothing uh, mentioned there about key stage four provision or progression routes into key stage five. I personally think that's a really important feature of um, really high quality music provision. And in fact, it's an outcome of all of these things together will often lead to really great key stage four provision. So you might want to have that in mind when you're looking at um, as you're doing your self evaluation or as you're doing a department improvement plan as well. Let's move on. So um, as well as those seven key features, there's three other things that I think are really uh, central to what schools should be thinking about in terms of the national plan. Uh, the first point um, is there about leadership for the subject and music should be represented in every school's leadership subject um, structure in some way. So whether that's with a designated music lead or with a head of department in the school or a head of department over a couple of schools, if you're in a, a small academy trust in a cluster, whether you'd have a, a primary music lead or a secondary music lead, you know, recognising um, the differences across those phases. Um, and also the support for wider uh, leadership, both in sort of governance structure and also support from SLT. All of this is there to recognise the need for direction with music education and the complex nature of music in schools. It really is unlike any other subject in a school in the way that the music lead has to interface with perhaps the music hub, maybe the lead person in their trust for music, someone like me, it might be that they're um, facing into the community, uh, community groups and um, those links for sort of local events and wider, wider exciting opportunities that might happen. Local primary schools might be linked into a network of freelancers, of peripatetic teachers, and also linked into parents and the wider community. So really the, the head of music is, is, is juggling lots of different balls up in the air. And uh, we really need someone who's gonna be able to uh, grab that and run with it. The second thing that um, music leads need to be aware of in the plan is this mention of the music development plan. And there's some timeline to that, but I don't know how strict it's gonna be, um, but it's mentioning that 
all schools should have one of these or done this thinking by September 2023. That seems like a long way off, doesn't it? And who knows what would have happened between now and then. I know that a lot of people are already thinking about it and that's what this session is going to be like as well. And the uh, this music development plan is there, well, they ask everyone to capture the curricula and co-curricular offer and set out how it's going to be funded in their school. So there's a recognition that music takes um, some different type of thinking in terms of how we're going to make sure it's sustainable and there's enough money there to, to be able to run it. And also recognising that it needs money um, to be done well. That's a, a very controversial area, but I think it's worth um, stating it now. It, there is a funding recognition around. Um, and there is a, also something for people like me to think about that multi Academy Trust um, will be expected to develop a trust wide development plan. But hopefully all of this is much more in the language of school improvement. I know that most music leads do a subject development plan or a department improvement plan or something like that every year. So this, I feel, um, is something that we're doing already. And um, hopefully we can just uh, do our development plans with the national plan in mind, rather than thinking very um, deliberately just about our own school, our own context. We need to think about where we sit within the wider national context when we're doing our improvement planning. And finally, the last thing for us to have on our radar is that there are going to be these lead schools uh, with the ambition that they'll be working in partnership with their local hub on CPD and peer to peer support. And yeah, I don't know anything. And that is genuinely me saying I really don't know anything about that. Um, but one thing I do know um, is that the schools are going to be really excited about this, partly because of the status. Um, but also, I think we need to be really realistic that um, it's it's about having impact beyond your own setting. So uh, the rationale uh, for putting something like this in the plan was that schools would be able to um, exemplify their CPD, um, to share really good practice um, and contribute to their hub partnership. Uh, there's a model for this already in maths and the behaviour um, hubs. And also, I think there are language hubs as well. Um, but I think this is really broadly to be welcomed. So um, I'm trying to kind of um, bash down the expectation that hubs are something and schools are something else. A hub is a partnership of lots of different organisations and schools is uh, definitely part of that and central to, to how it all works. So um, I promised I'd talk to you about resources. Here we go. Uh, one of the resources that there is out there, apart from the plan, which of course is on the, the gov.uk website, is that there is a three page summary um, written by the Music Teachers Association, which you can find um, if you click on that download our summary button, that should take you straight there. Um, and hopefully that's helpful. That's the kind of thing probably designed to put under the nose of SLT or under the nose of your local governors um, so they can see, uh, you know, generally what is the direction of travel. Um, but also it's quite a good thing just to keep in mind to refresh your memory. So there's that out there. And the other thing that we've put together, which I know that my, my brilliant colleague Jill has sent you in advance, is this um, self-evaluation tool. So um, hopefully you have that and you've been able to get it up on your screen or you've printed it off in advance. Um, if not, again, you can click into the screen here. It should take you straight away to the download page. And in the next part of the session, we're going to go through that self-evaluation process together in a sort of guided reflection session. So by the end of this session, um, you will have started to plot out your development plan. You can really pragmatically look out where you aim to build on your provision um, in this first year of the national plan. And let's remember the national plan is likely to be a 10 year process. So it wouldn't be realistic to try and address everything in a one year development plan. So it's a much longer um, strategic thinking uh, bit of work. So your plan is likely to be owned by your music lead in your school. Um, and it, But really, I think it's most successful when it's owned by everybody who's involved in music making. Uh, that includes the wider team. If you're fortunate to work in a team of more than one music educator in a department. I know um, that's not always the case. Some people are working on their own, these absolute heroes who are just flying the flag for music on their own in their school. Um, but there'll be other people who you want to contribute as well. So maybe senior leaders, 
or um, governors, you might want to consult young people on it. Um, I think that would be a really powerful thing to do. Um, your parents um, and other stakeholders, you might want to have conversation with your local music hub about it um, to find out more about how they can contribute or someone like me, uh, a lead in an academy trust. Um, and that will help you to identify areas for development and opportunities for working together. But for now, let's do it. Me guiding you through and you doing it on your own. But I don't know, actually, some of you might be sat in a department uh, or in an office or in a classroom at school with, with a group of colleagues. If you are, you're all very welcome. So, um, the self-evaluation tool is structured in four sections. First of all, talking about in the classroom. So that's a typical curriculum offer and the stuff needed in order to be able to do the curriculum. Um, also touching on things like assessment, um, progression, um, how successful that all is. Then the next section is about the beyond the classroom setting. So here we're talking about enrichment, we're talking about all the, 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 the things that blend that the young people can choose to, to participate in. And of course, there is a really strong connection between in the classroom and beyond the classroom. I always talk about that, the symbiosis between the two, that if you're beyond the classroom is working really well, then they're going to do better in the curriculum. And if the curriculum is really cooking on gas, then they're really, they want to come back and get more uh, in, in lunch times after school, first thing in the morning, or, or at all hours the ones you can't get rid of when you're trying to get home. So that's the, the first section of the self-evaluation self tool. Then it goes on to explore the, the necessary leadership um, and management of the department that's required, um, which also involves things like staff training. And then final uh, strand of the evaluation framework is about the community and partnership. So the outward facing nature of the department, things that don't always happen within the school, in the local community and on a national scale, how your um, department can be looking externally. And there is a, um, a kind of like a grading criteria. I hate saying lexical is very assessment-y, uh, but what we've tried to do is plot out what um, a focusing offer would be. So that is really the, the starting steps, getting things going. Then developing, which is probably where the plan kind of sits in terms of its language. Um, like this is the absolute minimum entitlement. This is the standard that um, all schools should hit. Then secure, which I'd say would be like a, a strong department that is uh, has got great outcomes and um, is doing really well, like a quite an established department. And then finally, enhancing um, is really the criteria for schools that are, I'm not going to say going above and beyond, because I think all teachers go above and beyond, but I think it's the criteria for schools that are doing nationally significant work. And those are the schools that I think are likely to be the ones where their hub is approaching them uh, to be involved in the, the lead schools program. Just a note on the focusing area. Um, it may be that you go through this evaluation and you think, oh yeah, I'm focusing here, I'm focusing there. And, and, and that might not feel great. Um, but my response to that would be, you have to start somewhere. And in my experience in this job, I work with 45 secondary schools and 20, eight primary schools and, and others as well in other settings. And I'm always working with some schools that are somewhere in focusing, um, partly because we have changed the department. Um, music is a strange area, not just because of the way that it, it speaks to all, all different stakeholders, but also it's often a single point of failure department where one person is holding everything together. And if they go, it can change very quickly. Um, or, or if, for example, things haven't worked out, it can change really quickly. So I wouldn't see it as a reflection on you. It's just partly to do with the complexity of what it means to run a music department. So enough of all of that, let's move and start doing some evaluation. So if I were you, I would have the, on one side of the screen, I'd have me 
chatting away. And on the other side of the screen, I would have the evaluation tool open or I would have it in front of me with a pencil or a pen ready to annotate um, and uh, get cracking and do some deep thinking. So now I'm going to present some, um, I'm going to talk you through some stuff and I'm actually going to leave some gaps for you to do some writing and to do some thinking. So um, I might not be talking all the way through, which I'm sure is a great a pleasure and uh, much better for all of you. So let's think about your music in the classroom. Let's, uh, the first area to consider really is your curriculum. At a focusing level, the full national curriculum might not be being delivered. So perhaps um, it might be still on the carousel or you might have some optionality of students being taken out of music for one reason or another. Um, and as such, it, there's not very high status of the subject and students, very few will, will carry on to the level two or level three courses of GCSE. Uh, vocational quals, etc. That's focusing. But the next step on from there, of course, is when the, the music is, is timetabled with schemes of work and assessment in place. All students, including those with SEND, are able to participate and engage with the curriculum. And there are progression routes in place, so students can opt to do the course. I'm not making a comment here about EBAC and pathways and things, but there is a class uh, every year for students who choose to do it. So that would be um, a developing department. However, a department that's secure is going to have, I think, probably quite um, an exciting curriculum uh, with uh, definitely weekly lessons with very clear curriculum sequence um, going right from uh, key stage three, key stage four and key stage five is necessary. And if you don't have a key stage five, it's likely to, um, to have strong links to other providers in the area and you can signpost those to students. And then the enhancing, it's going to be doing something that is quite, uh, you know, even going beyond um, and addressing those gaps in the curriculum, perhaps even by having trips and events and something that feels um, maybe even more authentic as a, as a curriculum experience that's looking to really address social disadvantage in what they're doing. You just take an opportunity and think, where do you sit in terms of that curriculum uh, progression? It may be that um, you've, you've developed a really strong key stage three curriculum, but actually for one reason or another, your key stage four isn't, um, hasn't quite taken off yet. Or maybe you've got a GCSE course and you'd like to have a vocational route as well. Just have a little look and maybe annotate it, uh, reflect on where you think your um, where you'd like to develop in that area, or maybe not at all. This is also a key part of the Ofsted framework, isn't it, in terms of intent, um, all the planning that needs to be in place. I'm sure many of you have got those like curriculum snakes and all that kind of stuff. So it really is the bread and butter of what we do. Not something could be addressed really quickly in a webinar, but I think it's a key part uh, that we need to recognise and, and consider carefully. So once you've got that curriculum in place, you're thinking about the, the student experience of it. Um, in, a, in a department that would be focusing, progress over time might not be measured, so not really any summative assessment um, in place. The, there may not be that much formative assessment either. But in a developing uh, department, would expect students to engage with the schemes of work and be building areas of musical interest with growing skill. They might know what to do next, but it's just an awareness, not a deep understanding. Whereas a secure department is going to have young people who are making um, secure progress in the technical, constructive and expressive aspects of music. Uh, again, this is very much the language of Ofsted, isn't it? And they will have an understanding of their progression routes into the careers and the wider music profession. Something to reflect on. I think those of us who deliver academic courses at the GCSEs and, e GCSEs and A levels aren't always thinking about the links into the profession in the same way that those on vocational qualifications are. But it's very much in the national plan that um, understanding about careers and pathways is something that is the, our role to make those links and to support young people with, and the profession of being asked to do that the other way around. So I'm hoping there's gonna be much more out there over the next couple of years. 
I mentioned about send in the curriculum piece, but it's just worth underlining that. Um, it might be an area that you think you need to develop in, particularly um, uh, to do with resources. And it's the last point I'm going to put in, in this in the classroom section, um, that we would expect there to be adequate space and resources for teaching. And what does that mean? Um, you know, adequate might just be a set of keyboards um, and maybe a few computers, but really we know to teach a full curriculum really well, we expect a set of tuned instruments, untuned instruments, and also music technology uh, should be in place. Music technology is a key part of the national plan, recognising um, how important it's been to young people over the past few years. Increased number of bedroom musicians and producers. There's so much scope um, out there for what's possible. Um, I'm seeing you know, really exciting things. Soundtrap, Ableton, even Bandlab. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a full studio rig to do things that are really exciting. So. Um, uh, if you don't have te technology in your school, that feels like an area you might want to be um, addressing uh, in your development plan. And uh, of course, a school that's going to be more secure is going to allow this breadth of curriculum for students with the resources that they have. So that's the reflection on in the classroom. I'm sure you've got a lot of things worrying through your mind. Now, once you've done that, you might want to organise your thinking in this way. If you see the little table I put at the bottom of the screen. So I was working with a teacher last week. We were going through this and they said, well, actually, the area that we really want to that we've identified that we want to work on is about making secure musical progress. And we would like our, our students to be much more secure with a constructive understanding of music. So what we mean by that is how music is put together. And actually what they meant really was to do with composition, but that kind of link between theory and composition and knowing how it all works together. Because they'd looked at their key stage four data and seen actually our students aren't really doing that well with composition. So we need to have this as an area for our development plan. And not just thinking about addressing it with the key stage four, they're going right back to year seven and thinking how can we make composition better in our department? It's a really important part of musicianship. I'll talk about the actions later, but you might want to now rack up, like just note down a list of the things that you think are the priority areas. You don't want to have loads because obviously, you know, it's not going to be um, realistic to address them all. But see, see how many you get on your list. Remember, we've got 10 years to put this all in place, but uh, write yourself a list and based on your reflections that you've had. I'll give you about um, 30 seconds to note that down and then we'll move on to the next area. If anyone has any questions, I'm going to try my best to pull up the Q&A and I'll have a little check in at this point. Um, so the Q&A is working rather than the chat. So if you want to um, add it in, then that's absolutely fine. If you want to just write in there. I've got somebody's got their hand up. Jackie has got her hand up. If you could pop your question in the q and A, I'll try and answer it there, or I'll just answer it live. Okay. Let's move on to the next area for consideration, which is beyond the classroom. So uh, beyond the classroom, as I said, is about that enrichment space. Um, and let's uh, consider singing as a starting point, because I know this is something that particularly at secondary, um, lots of people think about, but it can seem a bit of a scary area for, for some schools. So a school that's focusing would, um, as you'd expect, would have infrequent singing and with unvaried repertoire. So um, perhaps uh, only in one genre or, or unison, um, not really building on what the young people already have um, as a starting point. It is a good starting point, though. So let's not uh, deny that. It's a great place to start. In the developing um, school uh, department, singing and vocal work is frequent um, in the curriculum and beyond with varied repertoire. When we take it to the next level, however, we have a range of um, uh, repertoire um, 
that really is able to develop musicianship. So we're talking about like the listening skills of part singing and being able to hold a, um, a melodic line um, amongst a, a much larger group. Um, perhaps it doesn't have to be choral work, but it's something that maybe is uh, looking um, at uh, expanding repertoire in quite an exciting way. And all staff in school, not just one person, not just the, the Perry teacher for singing, but the whole department really, um, really go for it. And I say in a primary school, I'm doing primary tomorrow, but actually in a primary school, it would just be for everybody. It's like because singing is for the community. Um, and really, I think to it, the schools that are really doing this well, think about it over time in terms of singing strategy. Um, and that would be an enhancing category. So they're thinking about what does it mean for boys? What does it mean for girls? What do we have to have in place? And they're really deliberately developing it over time. So um, it doesn't matter where you are on that scale, but be worth reflecting what aspects of that um, are already captured within what you're doing. Of course, that moves on to us thinking about um, performance and um, uh, more regular performances in a, a school that's got developing provision um, would be for all young people, for even the most disadvantaged and those with SEND um, have this opportunity and there are termly events. Remember, that was from the seven key features, wasn't it? But in a secure school, you're probably going to be going by, beyond that, uh, maybe collaborating with other subjects school production uh which is always for me the highlight of the year um always my favorite thing in school um and um wouldn't just be within the school gates but also regional events um and uh informal concerts live lounges everything like that um, and then linking into the partnerships and community, which is coming up a little bit later. Um, and those enhancing schools, I'm thinking about music for youth, um, the big national events that you can get involved in. Um, like, as I said, the enhancing categories for um, people who are trying to do more nationally significant work. If you're not aware of the music for, youth music for Youth Festival, I would definitely go away and find out about it because there's some amazing opportunities to get involved at a regional level as well as the national level. Many of us probably were involved in that when we were young people, but the opportunity to maybe to perform in a really great local venue and also then go off to the Royal Albert Hall is the kind of stuff that changes lives. It's really um, memorable stuff. So have a think where you're in that. You might be already doing some of it in one category, but it might be further behind in some of the other categories. So I remember I was talking this week with someone who was doing a school production, but then they reflected that actually it wasn't engaging that many young, like diverse group of young people. It's the same young people year on year. That might be an example for you. Um, also beyond the classroom, we're thinking about how we facilitate um, in one-to-one uh, -one and small group tuition. I think um, uh, in lots of schools, this is proving to be very difficult at the moment because the financial barriers are um, are, are, can be very high for this. And even just finding great staff all, is also challenging. So I recognise the absolute challenge here. Um, but I think it's our job to face it head on um, and to not bury our heads in the sand about it. Um, we'd hope that developing schools would um, be given support um, for giving support for their pupils and families who are facing the largest barriers. Um, and uh, thinking really carefully about, for example, how pupil premium funds can be used to support provision. Um, but also in, in terms of a kind of cultural capital piece, um, schools also think about uh, how they can bring those opportunities to their young people. Uh, but in a school that's really secure, um, the one-to-one -one provision or small group um, uh, tuition is going to be um, maybe more reflective of the community and um, value all types of styles and genres equally. Um, it's really high quality and stretching. Um, we might also be drawing on staff and local stakeholders to really to, to bring it to life. Um, I'll go on to the enhancing category uh, at the end, but just uh, in the other um, areas, it's really talking about um, how you can track and identify gaps in your provision. So uh, the, in the developing uh, category, um, when we're talking about extracurricular activities, I'm sure a lot of people run clubs. Um, I mean, it's an absolute standard part of being um, a music teacher, isn't it? Um, and 
lots of people are always given the opportunity to par uh, participate. However, I think where a school, um, schools are, do some really exciting work, and this is in the secure category, is where it's tracked and monitored so that you can then cross cut and work out where are the gaps who are the young people who aren't engaging why is that the case what is it about what you're doing that isn't quite speaking to them you know music enrichment isn't for everybody but um i think uh it's um always important to be reflecting and uh to think about how you can cast it you know cast the net even wider to a wider group of young people so um, that, that I think is quite an interesting one for people to be looking at, um, rather than thinking, you know, just the seven key features, we're going to have a band, we're going to have a choir. I, what, what else is needed? What's going to serve a purpose best in your school? Um, and all through this, it's about supporting young people on an individual level. So not just saying, oh, there's something at the hub, but um, how can I help you to get there? Um, and it might even be that um, if they're going for things like the... Um, the National Youth Orchestra or even um, National Youth Orchestra like the Inspire Group or other national ensembles or, or even you know there's a whole plethora of things out there how can you find out about it if you've got a student who's really talented what can they do how can you support them to take it to the next level because they don't know what they don't know really um, and many of us wouldn't know about this stuff unless it was flagged to us by our music teachers lots of parents don't know and it's uh, within our gift to do that. So as I said, um, I was working with a school last week and we were talking this through and they started, we were having a really interesting conversation about this engagement point, recognizing it was a massive school of like a thousand pupils um, and the clubs were quite fairly well attended, but thinking, yeah, there must be more. So they were gonna begin to track their enrichment over the year. And in January, they're going to review it and, and see where are the gaps? Is it people premium? Is it boys? Is it um, send? Is it different year groups? All sorts of different stuff. So um, again, I'll give you sort of 30 seconds. You might want to just create a little list in the priority areas and the aims. Think I'm identifying what are some ideas? Where are some um, areas that we might develop so that we can be helping to contribute to this national plan? Okay, so you've got your list now of a few things that you're thinking about within the beyond the classroom category, and we're now going to move on to um, the leadership management strand. So, as I said, uh, an area of the national plan is um, has rightly outlined as being important is that there is a named subject lead in post, uh, but I think that um, a, a school that is in the developing category the subject lead needs to have some guidance uh, and you know just being just being given the title is never quite enough is it to be a, a head of department so uh, collaboration with colleagues across the school is an important part of it both in the department and beyond we know there's a lot of discretionary effort and um that kind of uh being an outward facing person is a really important part of running a music department being a music lead um, but also the support goes both ways. So um, the senior leader advocate, so that might be line manager, or it might even be beyond an SLT link, or it might be even better, be the head teacher, um, needs to understand the national curriculum and the school's curriculum and have an awareness of this national plan. 
So I think the thing that would probably take that to the next level into secure category would be for um, music to be referred to in the school improvement plan. Um, and that departmental development plan, the one we're talking about at the moment, is helping the school in what they want to do in terms of the whole school improvement. So, um, for example, a school might be thinking about um, attendance being a really big issue this year. I know school, a lot of schools are thinking about attendance and music's got a key role to play in that because um, for some young people, music is the thing that will get them over the door, get them over the threshold, being involved in the events, coming in to use the facilities and the equipment, um, having those strong relationships with the teachers in the department um, who are mentoring and supporting them. So um, being aware of the school priorities is also, um, I think, a key feature of a, a school that's secure. But also, um, we know that local governing bodies, um, if it's uh, a multi Academy Trust, it'd be trustees, but you've still got delegated scheme of um, like responsibility to the LGB. And um, we'd want them to be interested in what's happening. It, it might not be that they are the lead governor for music, but at least have somebody who is taking a special interest Go and offer to present to your LGB, talk to them about what you're doing, tell them about the national plan. Um, that's all, I think, a, a, a very positive thing uh, to be doing. Um, and those schools who are enhancing are taking that all to the next level and they will probably have a five year vision in place for their music um, uh, offer. And certainly um, if you're if you're part of a, uh, an academy trust, um, or a leader for an academy trust, you'll have to be thinking over the long term because there's so many complicated bits leading towards it. So you've got to have a kind of longer term strategy, I, I would offer. Um, so you've got these uh, great leaders in place who are talking to loads of people, but also we've got to make sure that all staff within uh, music are getting really great training, which is assessing their CPD needs. And in really secure schools, that's shared well with the wider team but also general expertise is shared uh, and not feeling that you can be siloed. I'm the strings person or I'm the vocal person. It's great to just keep developing our skill set. Um, and uh, the enhanced schools are going to be probably doing local or nationally significant work um, and might be doing some work with their subject associations or even with their hub in that lead schools role. Um, uh, the other thing that we might see in a school with where everybody is taking a really shared ownership of music is the modelling musical behaviours of all staff. So um, everyone participating, um, being active music listeners, active music participators. Uh, and I think that's at the core of a really great uh, music offer, a really great music team. So there's less to consider in this one. Have a think. Where, where are those bits where you think, yeah, I'm really, I'm already doing this, this is great, I'm doing loads of this, I've already been to another school, I've opened up my gates, um, I've had people come and visit to me and learn, learn about how I use music technology, but um, I'd also like to think about, you know, um, the stakeholders in my school, that might be your decision. Again, you're creating a little list, the school I was working with last week, um, recognised that they hadn't spoken about the national plan with their line manager or even shared it that much widely. So they were going to have that as their action, quite a simple action for them to address. And raising awareness of it is a really important part of the plan. I'll give you 30 seconds to, to write down your thoughts. What could be your priority areas in this, uh, this section? Again, if you would like to um, uh, type into the question and answer, um, section. There's approximately 30 of us here, so it'd be really nice to, to hear from you. Um, also, uh, if, you, if you'd like to contribute later on, I might, there's an opportunity I might um, take some people off mute if you've got any questions. So please do pop them in, uh, otherwise you can crack on with your thinking. Okay, we're going to move on. And the good news is we're going towards the final straight and we'll be finishing up soon. So you've all done brilliantly and um, I hope this has been a helpful part of your thinking process. So the, the final bit of thinking we're going to do is about the community and partnerships, recognising that 
um, the music department is not just uh, internal facing the school, but also it, it faces externally and has got actually so much scope for setting a school within its community. It really is quite powerful that great, uh, what great music making can do. Um, and I think uh, without getting sort of too uh, small P political, or even big people at all. Um, I think we could all do with some community building at the moment. So um, I think we're well placed to address some of the issues that there are um, uh, in our country. No pressure, of course, to all of you on the call. But I think you know it's worth recognising the role that music can play and how it can draw all of us together. It's really powerful. So a school that is focusing um, may not have much um, contact with their hub. Um, I am going to unap unapologetically bang the drum for hubs here. They, um, you know, they are tasked with um, making links with schools. Um, but if they make a link with school and the school doesn't respond, then it's really difficult for them to have impact. So um, at least to go in with an open heart and an open mind and be in touch with the hub and then make your own decision before you before you sort of um, decide that it's not for you at the moment because things do change. So. Um, you know, if you're if you're not engaged with your hub, um, you know, how could you? Uh, what scope is there for that? Um, and also um, community performances in a school that is maybe in the focusing category uh, might be just small um, with some parents being involved. But there's definitely room for development. So um, let's just talk about hubs uh, as general. I'll talk about the progression across hubs all the way through. So opportunities for the musical hub and, and signposting opportunities like ensembles, like summer schemes, like um, workshops, um, all the things that are on offer. I know it's very variable across the country, uh, but there is a lot out there that's that's possible. Um, and sharing information is just the, it's the first step in that, really, isn't it? As a developing department, but when you're more secure, you're probably an active partner in the hub, um, taking up taking up their opportunities. Um, I know there's typically can be more for primary than there is for secondary, uh, but um, you know often uh, there is always way to get involved, um, and particularly. The more involved you are, you're more likely to be able to influence what they are offering. Um, because if it isn't quite right, then they don't know. Again, if you're not involved, you're not having that kind of supportive, challenging conversation with them. For those of you who are really interested, I, I know that there are opportunities to be trustees with um, local music hubs, and that's another really good way of getting involved and influencing. So um, sort of embracing that ecosystem, the, the structure that there is for um, partnerships uh, on a local local scale. Um, the partnerships don't have to just happen with the hub. There's loads of community organisations um, that you can involve through musical partnership. Um, by here, I mean maybe with local um, arts organisations or primary schools or community ensembles or elderly care settings, all those um, different settings that really allow us to reach out to the community and make a difference. And young people really love doing that. Um, uh, often it's a very popular thing to do. Um, and to have a um, those opportunities which are programmed annually and are like a key part of the department delivery really do give students great opportunity involved in volunteering, which is gonna set them up well for progression routes, whether they're doing music or not. So thinking of um, how your department sits within the community can be a great way to stretch your provision and, and provide some great opportunities for young people. But we know that it's not just us who are important um, to facilitate musical learning. There is that triangle, isn't there, between us and the student and parents and carers. And um, whilst we open the door to them or our events, how much other opportunities they have to engage with provision and uh, um, you know certainly consulting with parents can be really um, effective that's in the developing category but there are lots of schools who consider um, bringing parents into their musical activity um, whether that's through choirs or ensembles or even through the young people teaching the parents. And I, I saw that last year at school that I worked with in Cambridge and it was really, uh, really exciting, very powerful. Um, and of course, we know that parents are great advocates for this um, and will have other skills that we don't have. So they might be really great at marketing. They might be really good at fundraising and bringing all that in can be really exciting. Um, and the other um, external view that the National Plan talks about is about careers and the music profession. And 
if a school has got good links into that wider ecosystem um, through events and trips, um, that is going to help them. It's going to it's sort of like joins everything up, doesn't it? The journey from key stage three to key stage four to key stage five to know what you're aiming for. Um, and uh, having established connections, I think really like you see in the national, nationally significant schools, schools that are doing like regular university trips, they've got a good pipeline through, they know um, they've got all the links and contacts. Not that it's all about that in music, but it does often help. Um, but to know uh, and to be able to picture somebody who's doing that can uh, really make quite a big difference if you're thinking about going into the profession. And after all, we want this national plan to lead and support um, a musically, um, like a rich, diverse uh, musical country and artistically diverse and inclusive country. And I think it does, um, I mean, everyone blames stuff on schools and say, oh, schools got to do this. But I think we do have a part to play, but I'm expecting the profession also to reach out to us over the next few months. And there will be one of the music hubs will be the, the kind of um, lead for, um, that links into the profession. So I'm expecting some really exciting things to come from that as well. So I say, I keep on saying, I've been talking about this one school who I've been having these really good conversations with. And this particular department identified that, you know, they're doing loads of stuff, but they think they're, they're kind of missing out, missing out on some links with their, their parents and carers. And they want to build better links with their family so that support for music develops. We'll talk about the actions, the kind of things they could do, but they just, at this point, they've recognised we haven't really considered our parents and we need to do so. So I'll give you about another 30 seconds. You might have a small list of things here. Um, probably not as many as the first two, the in school and beyond school. But you know, worth considering, you might be, again, really far on one of these, has some really strong community links, but you haven't perhaps um, done some of the industry links. Um, I can see Ben's uh, asked a question, hello Ben, Hi. Uh, about the lead school. So here I think this, uh, I, I assume you're talking about the, the lead school for the hubs. Um, there hasn't really been um, anything published as yet to describe how that process is going to work. Um, and it may be that some of the hubs decide to do it in a different way. But I think the plan was for each hub to have a lead school for primary and lead school for secondary in their region. And they might ask schools to apply for that and they might commission schools to do that, might actually say, recognise actually we want a day of someone's time in the department and they might pay them to do that. Um, I don't really know exactly what the model is going to be, but that is the plan that there should be a sort of like a lead school in every region across the country so that, you know, if Let's say, for example, um, uh, early career teacher ends up working in a school on their own, needs some help planning their GCSE curriculum. They can go along to that school and they'll get support on the ground in the school. So there's a really clear line of somewhere who can then um, host them. But I'm sure there's loads of other uh, examples of how that could work. Um, and uh, I see Chris has written something in the um, the question uh, chat about finding it, you know, um, uh, useful. Thank you for joining us, Chris. I remember you working at University of East London. I remember some of your trainees. So uh, it's always nice to have uh, familiar names and faces on these uh, sessions. Okay, show your little list there. Now, this for me is what provides a sort of um, beginning bones of a development plan. Now, maybe traditionally you might be thinking in development plan. Um, uh, often it's sort of like item one, improve the key stage four results. How are you going to do that? I'll read the examiner's report, make sure that I get the performances in on time, um, do intervention, blah, blah, blah. You can still have things like that in there. I think that's still fine because, um, you know, that is the bread and butter of what we're often asked to do. But what I'm trying to ask to kind of explore now is sort of um, how can we think broader than that, than just outcomes? Um, so you might have lots of areas um, at this point. So I've got that long list from each of these sections um, all underneath these headings. And now I want you to kind of consider which ones do you think are the most important to you? You might want to put like a little tick against that or like a little mark. Um, also, which ones do you think are going to have the biggest impact? 
Uh, which ones do you think, oh yeah, this is really going to transform what we do. I think the young people are going to absolutely love it if we, if we can really nail this. Or you might be thinking, which of these are easy wins? Which could I do before half term? Which could I do this term? Which are going to be the easiest ones to do? So you might be like, I'd be like drawing an arrow, easy, smiley face. But you also might be thinking, which are the hard ones? Which ones are going to be really difficult? Which ones pretty much are not going to be cracked in a year? Again, I'd be rather do an arrow and I'd do like a little kind of grouchy looking face on those ones. You know, those ones are probably going to go into year two, year three, or even later uh, of your planning process, potentially. Okay, so as you know, um, I had a few things that I'd already worked on with a teacher and um, this is how we kind of plotted them out. And this would be our plan really for 22, 23. And um, they're not in order. Well, they are in order. We've got um, curriculum was the most important thing. Then um, the beyond the curriculum was the second. Um, then community was the third. And then actually the fourth was leadership and management, just because we thought that was quite an easy one to address. So essentially we're sort of rag rating them really. Um, and uh, just as we had um, previously in this session, you can see I put some, some uh, detail there about what are the aims. Now, once you have the aims, you need to work out what are the things you're going to do to hit those aims. I'm, some of you I'm sure are familiar with things like smart targets, where they need to be specific, measurable, um achievable what are they realistic and time measured time sensitive i think that's it i'm not going to go into too much detail about smart target settings you can just like to turn them to google and google will tell you um but this was our thinking about the kind of things we might have as actions to support these areas of um priority so for example thinking about constructive understanding of music so composition there's clearly some space for some cpd this links nicely into the leadership and management box, actually. Um, think of those great courses from passing notes, or you might buy some books. Um, I, I'm not on commission for passing notes, by the way, but they are really great. Um, so um, doing some personal development in that area and link to that, reviewing what does composing look like in our curriculum sequence? So not thinking of, I don't know, a genre-based curriculum or a topic-based curriculum or um, a context-based curriculum or a concept-based curriculum. Like, how do year seven experience composition? How do year eight experience composition? How do year nine experience composition? Cross cutting your curriculum in that way so you can really think, okay, how can we support these young people to really grow from year to year? And actually improvisation was also within that composition too. And um, I think we set some due dates, I can't remember really what, but you know, they had more, they would specific endpoints for this. And then on the engagement one, we're tracking the enrichment. They realised they hadn't done proper registers and they were going to try and set that up in Arbor. And then in January, they're going to review what had been going on. So that was quite some simple ones to address straight away. And in January, they're going to come back to it and do some kind of data crunching. We all love a better data. Um, and finally, on that community area, recognising that actually the parental um, uh, links uh, you could go in loads of different directions with this, but they thought the first point, because they really wanted um, instrumental um, provision and the one-to-one -one provision to be much more successful, and we felt there was a good synergy there. So asking, uh, well, uh, going to establish um, informal peri informal peri tea time concerts so that like the peris will sort of present their, their class um, of learners um, over tea and coffee so they get to know the parents in that, that scenario um, and also producing some guides uh, to go along with the termly peri report or I think it was half yearly peri report and that would be a longer term um, like slow burn over a few years and then finally on the leadership and management you can see that there was a, an aim to address the national plan which was really easy to do and they're going to do it straight away so this example now, I suppose the next step for you, which is the exciting bit, is to use your list, then plot out what could you do this year, what will maybe pop into next year, maybe the year after, and try and kind of formulate how are you going to start to, you know, to, to think about these broader things, move beyond just uh, outcomes, like in terms of key people outcomes. What, what can we do to really like get this holistic music department 
um, as intended. And remembering the final thought that if any of one of these seven things is missing, this really should be part of your development plan. You know, we know it's at the heart of a strong offer for children, young people. Um, and wow, if, if this was available for every young person in the country in our secondary schools, it really would go a long way to addressing the equity of provision, um, addressing lot, much of the kind of social injustice and um, diversity issues there are in and around music education. So I really just want to leave that as your final thought. So um, I'm here for the next couple of minutes. You're very welcome to go enjoy your evenings. But if you've got any questions, you can type them in the chat. You can also get in contact with me through the MTA or through United Learning. It's just katherine.barker at unitedlearning.org.uk. And you can find out more about Music Teachers Association by clicking on the link to the website. Um, but that's it for me this evening. Uh, those of you who've watched it on record all the way to the end, well done. And um, yeah, I hope you, I wish you all the best in the development plans. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing you at an MTA event at some point. Thanks everyone. Have a lovely evening. Um, so I'm just going to answer a question from um, Zoe uh, about uh, one hour fortnight due to costs. Any advice on how to tackle this? So um, the Ofsted Research Review is a good starting point because it does outline that the sort of expectation for um, delivering the full national curriculum or the full curriculum offer is a once a week uh, offer for music. Because schools have got the choice, right? They can choose how to how to deliver their budget. Many have decided to get rid of things like DT, um, but uh, I think um, on the quality of education judgment, it makes it quite difficult within the inspection framework. Um, the uh, I think one way you can sort of address it is by having a really strong enrichment provision where it's clear that young people can engage beyond the classroom if they want to do more and take their curriculum further but in terms of um like making the case to a head i think the Ofsted research review um and the inspection framework is is usually quite a helpful starting point there's also um some webinars from Ofsted about music that mark phillips did before he handed over to chris stevens that talks about that as well uh yeah she <laughs> told them that several times um yeah it's a it's a ongoing challenge it's a difficult one i mean if you're in united learning we talk about weekly provision all the time i'm obviously biased but um uh also it can be um useful to point out that if you want to be ready to deliver or to do a key stage four course your students will be at a disadvantage because they've had half as much curriculum provision in key stage three so uh, that's another one of the arguments to make in the case for music provision um, but you'd have to be working in a really big school for you to have a full timetable of music, um, which is, I guess, um, interesting. I don't know what your timetable model is. Anyway, um, good luck with good luck with that, Zoe. Um, yeah, I'm sure if, like a really great curriculum, people will just want more of it. So. Okay. People beginning to drop off. I've got 10 or 11 people still on here. Uh, if you want to um, ask a question, please just chuck it in the chat. I'm going to be here for another one minute or so. Um, but thanks for joining us. <laughs>